next speaker is William Wiley. Um, when I was um, thinking of being editor in chief of the RC, I was told by several people, talk to this man. He will set me on the right path. And uh, I think I looked up pretty well. And so uh, he <laughs> was. Editor, I hope that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. I'll find out that. that be, no. um, but uh, former editor in chief uh, of the RC and uh, former Cup Bureau chief. And also Atlantic? Yep. Uh, sorry. Two terms. <laughs> <laughs> Two terms. So he's going to uh, give a great talk, I think, uh, about some things that he did while he was the IC and uh, things that are applicable to each paper. So. Well, thank you. All right. I'm going to warn you that um, there's a few of us who work in print for a reason, because it's speaking in front of giant people slash cameras uh, into microphones, not generally what we do well. <laughs> Um, so take that into account as I ramble on here. Uh, so basically what I want to talk about today is the number of things that we do uh, to engage with our audiences. Um, right now everyone runs a newspaper. Prints once a week, every two weeks, sometimes once a month. I want to talk today about why that's the worst approach for actually getting in touch with our audience and doing our job as journalists. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, everything that we do for special sections, public events, interactions with people on mobile devices. We're going to talk about um, increasing brand awareness. Uh, you know, brand is a weird marketing or to speak thing, but actually applies more and more to us these days. And how we can increase our role as a public investigator. Um, there's a lot I'm going to go through in, uh, I guess, I'm going to aim to be about 35, 40 minutes and then leave some time for questions and discussion. But really, feel free to interrupt me at any point if uh, you have any questions or anything you want to add. Any extra perspectives from your own paper to uh, add to the discussion here. So basically, newspapers as we know them today are about 100 years old or so. Uh, that's when the idea of an objective press that wasn't fueled directly by political leadership, uh, the idea of using it to tell stories and get involved in um, educating the masses, really started to come into play. It's about 100 years ago or so. But the idea of uh, the tools that they had at the time was really, if you controlled the press, you controlled everything. The first people who controlled the press controlled the access to information, controlled access to the power of information, controlled access to who had the ability to get information out there. Nowadays, that's not true anymore. Um, the internet is now about 15 years old in its public capacity. And now everybody has that ability. The people who own the presses, their power is dwindling every day. But for people like us, whose job is to tell stories, whose job is to take a look at what's going on in the world and how it's affecting everyone, um, we have more and more tools available to us every single day. Uh, so today I want to talk about what we can do to use those tools to get out of this idea that we are newspapers. Because these days we're so much more than newspapers. We're community builders. So there's, I want to talk about print, which is our traditional product that we've been doing for hundreds of years. Um, the Argosy since 1875, the Zav since 1879. Oh, where's Zav get? Oh, all right. I thought I was going to get corrected on that. Uh, and the Bruns, I think, is even older than that, like 67. 67. Oh, so not consistently since 67. <laughs> we have a debate about who's going to be a paper in Canada yeah. later. Publication. Publication, there we go. Uh, so we're going to talk about print, which we've been doing for um, about 130, 40 years, give and take. Uh, we can talk about desktop. Uh, people are using the internet on their computers, um, obviously on their computers, but people are using the internet to get at news more and more. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about mobile. This is something that's even newer. When I was involved in the Argosy, some people had a cell phone. Um, we thought they were the rich kids. Uh, people were just starting to make the move to laptops in the classroom. A few of those were there now and then. But the, uh, the, the revolution that is mobile technology is really changing the way a lot of journalists do their work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And the newest form, which is interactive, which is a bit of a paradox because it's also the oldest form of journalistic interaction. So how many people, just by a quick show of hands, have bought a paper copy of a newspaper that you have not produced yourself in the past month? 
more than once. Ma magazine or newspaper? Newspaper. Okay, so we got three people left with their hands up who have said more than once in the past month. Um, you printed your own copy of your newspaper more often than I. So that should be a sign of where things are going. Um, I work for an organization that, while well, convincing them that the, new pr the paper product is not something to be relied on has been a challenge. We'll say that. <laughs> so, um, I want to talk a little bit about getting individual audiences out there. Uh, one of the things that we did at the Argosy was we realized that while we had a weekly newspaper product, there were significant audiences that were ignored in our weekly product. Um, whether we were going to talk about niche uh, interests like environmentalism, where we were going to talk about uh, neglected cultures, whether we were going to talk about um, just things that deserve a little bit more attention that we don't get to dive into in a regular way. So we had a little bit of an editorial board meeting, we got everyone's heads together, and we decided how are we going to actually get these people together, get, get them to have a voice. And the first thing that we did was we came up with the idea of special sections. How many people have run special sections in the past little while? They're hard to do, right? So we decided that the Argosy shouldn't produce special sections. We should publish them, not produce them, which is a bit of a, uh, a weird way of looking at it. So for an environmental supplement, what we did is we got in touch with the um, professor who was looking at environmental studies, and we said over the summer, in advance of everything, while he was putting together the syllabus for the next year, and we said, we'd like to work with you in your class to add it as a class project that your job is to figure out a way to present an environmental issue uh, to the masses in a non-academic capacity, to educate a larger number of people than just yourself or your professor on how to get this word and this information out there. And the term project was to write, to do this, and one of those elements was to write an article for the Argosy. Um, he agreed, he thought it was a great idea, and then we had all this file submitted, and we picked the top 15 or so, and we put that together into a supplement. So instead of getting all of our editors together and all of our writers and all of our volunteers and trying to mass out a different variety of story ideas, we got the people who cared about the most deeply to do all the writing for us. We then did a quick little, uh, we took one of the classes and we taught them how to write for journalism because every editor in this room knows that academics don't know how to write for newspapers. <laughs> and we sort of taught them about what a lead is, where did, how to do an interview and why they're important taught them how to orchestrate quotes into their stories and why they are important. And we taught them how the editing and a little bit about how the newspaper process works. And so I'll show you a quick look. There we go. So we did an environmental supplement. And this was basically a chance for just our designer to have a lot of fun. And every single article was written by a student in this in this class, from Dutch Elm disease to uh, cleaning up the air, West Nile. We did a fun little uh, centerfold. We uh, supposing that uh, if um, the inconvenient truth, which came out right around the time, was correct and the ice caps melted and water rose by such and such level, we did a little map of Sackville on where the new water line was going to be. Cool. So there's uh, there. Well, this is the university right there. So this is Main Street intersection, and this is where the new water line was going to be at Al Gore's right. And so that was a fun little way to just, we had a, one of the students was doing a minor in geography and made a quote of a the map and show us where the water was going to come in through the dikes and where the rivers were overflowing. And, and you can see the athletic center is now underwater. <laughs> and so this was a great way of uh, introducing people to it. We did one for gender. Uh, from different cultural perspectives, different religious perspectives. We did one on gender violence. And we did an international supplement written entirely by international students, which made the editing a challenge for our people. Uh, because most of these people were English as a second language. And it was written about, about from uh, all students from across the world who were calling Canada home for a year, for four years and about their experiences here. And this was, we did two of these per semester. And this was a way that we figured we could show everybody how diverse our campus is. This was a little project for our illustrator. 
how diverse the campus is, how many different viewpoints there are, and bring other voices than our own into the fold. This is one of the big challenges that newspapers face, is that we often think that we are the only ones capable of having a voice. We're the trained writers, we're the trained researchers, we're the trained interviewers, we're the ones who know how to put a newspaper together. Does not mean that we are the only voices worth sharing. A lot of people in our community are very well-spoken people, but very interesting stories to tell, and sometimes the best thing to do is just give them the pen and you can turn over the presses. And that's what we call community building. One of the other things that uh, you can do, though, is to get outside of your offices. Um, building a newspaper is one thing, but we tend to hide away in our offices and not really get outside and inter interact very much. Um, there's a number of major news organizations in the world that are fighting against this idea on a small scale. And sometimes small is better than big. Uh, the New Yorker, major magazine, well respected, every month they take a high level, thought provoking idea and decide, you no, know, we're going to host a public debate about this idea. Uh, this month it's Occupy Wall Street. Get uh, an economist together, a business leader together, a uh, protester together, put them on a stage with four or five hundred spectators and just sort of say, guys, what do you think? Let's have a public debate. Let's see how deep this issue can go. Uh, the Walrus magazine in Canada does a very similar thing every now and then. Not quite on a monthly basis, but they host similar debates. So we decided we can do that. Universities are filled with experts. They're filled with students. They're filled with people who are willing to care and willing to debate. And while we were doing this, uh, the big issue that everyone was talking about was uh, rising tuition. That hasn't really changed all that much. Um, but with that came a debate on whether the university should be a public body or a corporate body. Is this about for the education for the people who can pay? Or is this a public service? Everyone has the right to education. Those are two conflicting ideologies that can really impact how an institution like a university is run. So, what's this say? No. Uh, sorry. There it is. So we hosted a, a public debate. We hosted it in uh, an auditorium here at Mount Allison. And we called it Mount Allison Inc. What is the role of the public university? And this was uh, when uh, Robert Campbell, who's now the president of Mount A, this was his uh, first semester on campus. So we grabbed him while he was green and eager uh, to make a good impression. But we got the head of the economics department uh, to sit down. We got the president of the university. We got an international relations student and a member of the students' union to sit down and have a public debate. We had about, about 100, 150 uh, people spectating in on that. Uh, Mr. Dave Shipley, who was uh, here earlier, uh, came in from the Telegraph Journal, he was working there at the time, and uh, wrote a little piece in the provincial newspaper about it. And we had a, a lot of fun. So this was a way of not, this didn't result in an Argosy article. Uh, this didn't result in changes to policy. But the people who cared most deeply about it were able to come out and have a live chat in front of everyone, and the Argosy w was able to have their brand on top of that. To say that we're a place where we don't only care about putting out a weekly newspaper, we want to bring people together and chat about the ideas that matter. Um, if anyone's really interested, I realize as well that we actually have the, uh, the audio recording of that transcript in there. there. That. Crap. Help. Uh, allow. Done. <laughs> Lesson one, don't click on things. No, I don't, I don't want to open it. Oh, you don't need no. to? Okay. okay. No one needs to hear like an hour and a half of people talking to a microphone right now. <laughs> um, so basically what we did is we, for this kind of thing, you really need to plan really far in advance. Um, we started approaching people about three months before the actual event, just sort of saying, you know, to the president of the university, are you guys interested in doing things like this? Like, if we found the availability in your time slot, would this be something you'd be willing to step up and do? Um, yeah, you got to work into their schedules early. You got to get um, research done early, and a little bit of promotion early. We peppered the campus with posters um, and got it going. Uh, every participant was also then sent 
a package filled with uh, reading material uh, that re revolved around commercialism and higher education, uh, market schools, private universities, and their models that are run in the states. Um, all sorts of, and speeches that people had written in newspapers. All sorts of fun things. And we issued everyone a, uh, a formal invitation. Which made life fun. They like to get mail. So that's one way. Again, as I was saying earlier, this is a, a public discussion is one of the oldest forms of journalism around. People used to sit around campfires and tell each other stories. Well, how was your day? Well, I went and raided a village, and I got back all this cool stuff. You should hear the tale. It was really awesome. That's journalism. That's how it all started. Hosting a giant group of people together and discussing a core issue of the day. And so this is something that's really easy to pull off and gets you outside of your newspaper and into your community in a way that you're, most people aren't right now. Um, getting into the 21st century, um, Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, um, brand is about everything. Branding is difficult to do, but it's enormously important to do, especially when newspapers are competing against one another. I mean, even in Sackville, there's the Sackville Tribune Post, which is technically a competitor, although I think the RC does a better job. Um, in Fredericton, you have four or five different competitors you're running against. St. John you runs the same problem. In Newfoundland, there's dozens of local papers. Everyone is vying for the same audience. And so if people need to attach certain ideas that they're looking for, that they value, to your newspaper. And that's why they're going to come back to you, and that's why they're going to be looking to you for advice and for news and for updates. And like it or not, the word, that's what we call brand. So there's a few ways that you can get go about this. One is by peppering the campus with posters, as uh, we did. We I discovered a new tool in Photoshop that lets you put um, letters on top of buildings. <laughs> so I did that a lot. We peppered the campus with these. It was a lot of fun. They showed, started showing up at house parties. But the other way these days, it's a way that a lot of you are now getting into because now we're getting into the 21st century. Now we're getting into things that you guys do all the time already, which is Facebook pages, Twitter accounts, getting people on their mobile devices and on their computers. How many of you guys are hosting debates on your Facebook pages? A little bit? Sort of. Sort of. Uh, posting breaking news to Twitter accounts? Sort of. Who you guys are? Oh, I am. Yeah? Uh, how about asking for advice from your readers? What are we doing well? What should we be doing more of on your Facebook or Twitter accounts? This is the connected generation. This is, these are the people who have smartphones in their pockets everywhere they go. Um, and we're not using these technologies. We have a, one, one of my jobs right now is to train 60 year olds who learned how to do journalism in the 1970s, how to use all these technologies right now to further their engagement with their audience. We have uh, a publication in North Bay, Ontario. I think they're, they're daily, but their circulation is it, tiny. Um, but they're one of the only games in town. And by managing their Facebook page properly, am I able to get on the internet in here to show you an example of this? It should work. Should, should work? All right, so they're in a town of about 15,000 people. A third of the town likes the, newspa the newspaper's Facebook page. They update every day. They post discussions. Townspeople give them quick little updates on the newspaper page about what they're doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> 25 comments from random people. Taking my daughter to the workshop hosted by Bestar. Recertifying my CPR. The daily newspaper. They just say, well, shit, I don't know what we're writing on Sunday. Let's ask people what they're up to. See if there's something worth covering in there. <laughs> and see, they reply. Hey, we were there this afternoon writing a story about it. Mind if we comment? Moving Tribute, they post a lot of pages from their own thing. Uh, last week on this page, uh, they had a power outage in town. They had dozens of people 
posting on their Facebook page without even a call out from the paper where the power outage had extended to. Hey, I'm out by the airport. Power's out here. Hey, I'm just a little bit further than that, actually. Power's on where I am. Line must be near the airport somewhere. We get debates going on here. This is when you start to form community, and this is what I'm talking about with getting outside of the paper product. Instead of holding on to stories until the day before publication, hitting update the website in a massive streak, you can use all of the tools available to you, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Facebook, whether it's your website, embeddable tools, um, which I'll get to in a little moment. This is what you can start to do, is build community with your newspaper as the brand that people gather around to share their ideas. There, this puts the power edge. It's out of, up at the airport too. They have a third of the town that takes part in this. Uh, there's a, other things that you can do. How many of you guys post uh, job advice, job offers, or um, job openings for your paper on sites like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter? Yeah. Anyone else? How many of you guys have LinkedIn profiles? Do you? Do you? Twitter? <laughs> Twitter? Facebook? Twitter. Yeah. So if you guys are there, how many of you guys think your readers are there? So why isn't your newspaper there? It's a question I got asked. Uh, okay. Furthering along with the, the electronic stuff, do you guys know programs like Cover It Live? You know Cover It Live. Anyone else? This is a free service, which means it's brilliant because everyone loves free stuff. Uh, here, I'm going to log into my newspaper right now. So basically what this allows you to do is it's an embeddable piece of code. So, yeah, sorry, those are the technical uh, errors of each one around the audience. If I say an embeddable code that you can drop onto your website, does everyone know what that means? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That's the first room I stood in doing the session that people said that. The first room that you stood in where the majority of people are under 50. Mm. Under 50, really. <laughs>
answer local questions, tickets in town. Seen it used at universities where the university president can get on board, take direct questions from students with uh, tuition about state of construction on campus or destruction in some cases. Uh, this is what we mean, this is what you can use to host these kinds of live events for your office because student journals love being in their office. Uh, you can use it. Do I need to show you Google Plus or are people familiar with the, uh, the layout? Okay. People, okay. I'm going to show it to you anyway. Um, yeah. It doesn't fully make sense and I use it a little, but I don't get it. It makes no sense to me, so please do. Yeah. <laughs>
the entire raw data of every parking ticket ever issued in your city, where it was, what neighborhood it was in. Is this a rich neighborhood or a poor neighborhood? Do poor neighborhoods get ticketed more often than rich neighborhoods? Who fights their parking tickets? Can we cross-reference it with, with courts and just look at that data? Who wins their fights with parking tickets? Are rich people just never pay parking tickets? Is that a poor people thing? Uh, turns out, yeah. Uh, the city of Vancouver released their parking ticket data to the Vancouver Sun after an extended court battle. And uh, it turns out that, yeah, parking ticket information is a really good way of profiling how the city treats poor and rich neighborhoods. Poor people get treated like shit. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that you can have just by looking at the data. And so this movement has started called Open Data, which basically says that all of the data that a city produces, whether it's budget uh, templates, um, or, or um, yeah, tables, that's what I'm looking for, budget tables, whether it's um, you know, parking ticket information, whether it's uh, laws and the process they go through, whether it's uh, just about anything, whether it's um, income taxes, whether it's property taxes, anything at all, there's data associated with it. And we as journalists have a right to see it. Why? Because our tax dollars paid for the creation of that data. Universities, your tuition fees and tax dollars paid for the creation of data here. And so what's preventing you from just having a look at the raw spreadsheet that explains how the school is run, where money goes, how decisions are made? And so I'll show you uh, a quick example here. So when you're in here, there's a lovely little product called Google Fusion Tables, which is basically a spreadsheet program designed for the web. So everyone here has used Excel, made a spreadsheet at some point in their lives. Now what if you could embed that spreadsheet, run through a visualization engine to make it a graph or a map or a heat map with bigger circles to represent different pieces of data on your website for, uh, for your audience to see and interact with. So we did a little thing a little while ago. Yeah, we'll use that one. The city of Vancouver posted uh, all the data for city heritage sites on their, uh, on their open data website run by the city. Basically, all it is is this. You can see the, the spreadsheet here. You have an address. You have a distinction outlined by the city. You have the geometry, that's basically just a GPS link of where it is. And, if available, a photo. The city published this. So you can just tell Google to visualize that as a map. And there is every single heritage designated property in the city of Vancouver outlined on a map. Click on any one of these little dots. Gives you all the information that's contained in that table. And of course, then you can say, get the embeddable link. And that's what you can copy onto your website and share this with all of your readers. Um, I won't spend too much time on this because it's, uh, it can get pretty complicated. But this is, if you start looking into data journalism, this is the kind of stuff you get to learn. Um, what comes with data journalism is basically using all this information contextually. So you can start to look at those heritage properties, for example, and say, okay, let's look at all the uh, property tax databases for the city. Now let's look at, cross-reference that with city-owned property. Let's look at how many heritage properties are owned by the city and what the tax dollars were. Well, what do you think the odds are that the city is paying tax dollars to itself? I'm going to go with pretty slim. So is that $500 million of tax dollars annually that the city is then dinging over to the Irish taxpayer because they like owning pretty buildings that are really old? Maybe. You turn it into a money story like that. Arthur Miller, he was a playwright, we cited him in high school. Um, he said in the 40s that a good newspaper, I suppose, is a nation talking to itself. Your job is to make that conversation happen. And these are some of the tools that you can start to use to learn it. And it doesn't revolve around dead trees. <laughs> so if anyone has any questions or ideas, now's the time to share. Okay. I had a 
similar sort of like on that same note is what sort of uh, social responsibility do we have when we're no longer or lessening our sort of direct engagement with the community, for example, in Sackville, when we're doing it up now more on Twitter or Facebook, or Google Plus. Uh, do we have the responsibility to, um, like, we're changing the way people interact and we're encouraging a certain type of interaction that is, well, different than it was in the past. And we're not really sure what the, yeah. the end result is in, in a grander social interaction there. I think is there people are already changing the way they're interacting, and now newspapers are figuring out how they're going to catch up. Um, you're right, I think there does need to be a core product that people can always turn to and find what they want to, to see. There has to be a core product that will come out on a routine basis, because breaking news does not work on Twitter, there's not a link to more information. You can't just say, guy killed on campus. <laughs> Initially and stop there. Initially you can. Initially you can, but you better have something to follow it up with. Well, I remember the day Jack Layton died, I was entering the TVC. Yeah, you know. And I walked at the story meeting, and on the big TV mounted in the room, I saw Peter Mansbridge standing there at 9 in the morning, and then the headline, Jack Layton got it. And he turned right around and went back into the story meeting. Well, I immediately <laughs> tweeted it out, and then um, like we had a, store, uh, a news story, and I got yeah. that link up. Yeah, absolutely. But if you just say Jack Layton died and you had a series of tweets, not everyone is on Twitter. Not everyone has a smartphone. Not everyone is going to be accessing on that platform. Um, more and more, to address the, your the social question, is attacking people, not attacking people, but engaging people on their platform of choice and being as accessible to them there. And it's going to take a lot of work. Um, you're still going to put out a paper, I think for probably another 10 years or so. Uh, and then everything is going to be slowly moving towards the web. Uh, the idea of a weekly publishing schedule is going to die. Uh, everyone's going to be moving to an on online publishing schedule, which means when it's ready, it's up. And everyone can read it in immediately in real time. Um, right now, the business model won't quite support that, but you guys are sheltered from that because you guys have a student levy which means awesome. <laughs> uh, you have a guaranteed supply of income, and you don't realize how awesome that is until you lose it, which is basically what everyone does when they leave the student press. Uh, but you guys have an enormous opportunity to experiment with that right now and be sheltered from the business model that uh, is driving everyone else to keep printing dead trees. Um, so to address the social question, yes, you do have a responsibility to engage everyone on their preferred platform, um, but the preferred platform doesn't necessarily mean the platform the majority are on. I'll just say quickly, uh, <coughs> I think we have to take our break. Uh, yeah, I, I emailed, uh, I think what we touched on uh, engaging with faculty is really important because there are there are faculty who are um, a pro student press and they just need to be asked. Um, I, there's a class here on environmental activism and uh, he got in touch with me and he, he laid out that you know all of these students, they have strong stances on issues but they can't um, make them clear to the public or they can't convince people to agree with them. So he just sent me five or six, you know, op-ed style articles for his class that we were basically going to edit and review off the commentary on and that's going to be the basis of his marathon, right? And we and like what you said about doing a supplement could very well be one of those opportunities. So a lot of a lot of the time
line to walk because simultaneously you're advocating cheap education, you're advocating lower fees, you're advocating tuition increases, you're saying education is a right, and then you turn around and say, but this whole thing costs money and we really like some. Um, it's a hard line to walk, and what I find most of the goodwill that you get um, from the student body comes through your coverage. Uh, if people are lining up to pick up your paper in the morning, that's a good sign. And the reason they do that is because they respect and value what's in the pages. Um, you know, you can look at your hit counts when, uh, on the website if um, it's regularly maintained. You can tell which articles are striking a chord in the student body and which ones are not. The umpteenth memorial to Steve Jobs that everyone's read 1,500 times? Probably not going to do that. Um, breaking news about campus projects that no one's ever known about but are going to be controversial? Probably going to do that. Um, I remember back in the student press days, we uh, got a scoop on a story about faculty negotiations, and they were starting up uh, in, a, in a week. And faculty were coming up to the newspaper office saying, how the hell do you know about this before we do? And we said, you know what? Talk to your union rep. That's all you got to say. Uh, their job to inform you of these things. But when you start to do that kind of thing and start to dig under the skin of it and start to peel it up, um, you start to expose stories that are valuable to the audience. And if they're coming at you every week to learn the stories that are valuable to them, then that's going to help you get those referendum dollars when they realize what you're going to be doing.